High noon on the great plains of Africa. Kenya's Maasai Mara game reserve is renowned as country where big cats are found. Not just lazy lions and confident cheetahs, but one that's far more secretive. Truly a cat that walks by itself, the leopard is intensely shy. Although not uncommon, it is seldom seen, its solitary form concealed by the colors of Africa. So elusive is the leopard that its habits and behavior have been difficult to study. Through the years, despite their notorious ability to hide, leopards fell prey to human hunters and trackers, and those that survived became even more secretive. But on rare occasions, a leopard will allow a close and careful approach, giving us a glimpse of how it lives. One example is this female, which was watched and followed for more than four months as she raised her cubs. It's mid-morning in November. Having recovered yesterday's kill, a gazelle, from the tree where she hid it, the leopardess is returning to her lair. The cover of the long grass and the scatter of the trees and thickets to hide in make the Mara ideal country for leopards to share with the competing lions and hyenas. The female mated last April, and three months later, somewhere on this ridge, gave birth to these fast-growing cubs. At four and a half months, the cubs are still nursing, but more and more she is weaning them to the meat she brings back to the lair. Already they compete vigorously for a share of the gazelle. She has a trio of cubs, of which the largest is a male. But with so many predators around, it's unlikely that she'll manage to raise all three beyond their playful youth. Sharing this patch of forest is a tiny antelope, no bigger than a hare. Dick Dick live in secret under the leopard's nose, and only their shy ways prevent them from being eaten. The leopard's lair lies at the heart of her range, the area of some 10 square miles over which she roams. Although solitary, leopards do communicate by noise or by a scent which they spray onto prominent trees and bushes. These pungent messages linger for days and even weeks, a warning to other leopards that the range is occupied. Female leopards don't defend the area in which they live. Each home range spills into the terrain of neighboring females, but the animals keep strictly to themselves. Only when a female is receptive, a brief six days or so every month or two, does she forsake her solitary ways to breed. Not until her cubs are grown will the mother become receptive again. No other female was seen during the four-month watch. But within the range, there is another leopard, an adult male. With his more powerful build and broader muzzle, he's half again as big as the female and probably weighs 120 pounds. 
He's almost certainly the only male here, and the likely father of her cubs. Below the leopardess's lair, herds of plains animals gather to feed on the open grasslands. Among them are impala, which play an important role in the leopard's life. In November, pregnant female impala leave the herd to give birth on the ridge. Here the fawns are well hidden in the long grass and bushes. Barely 30 minutes old, the fawn knows how to walk. In order to survive, it must develop other skills, such as the ability to run and hide. The leopardess appears to know that a solitary impala female usually has a fawn nearby. No matter what the time of day, such opportunities are not to be ignored. A supreme hunter, her patience is infinite. She may spend hours edging closer and closer. Nearby, the fawn lies hidden. Remarkably, the impala has not seen the leopard. Nevertheless, she nervously moves off. Unaware that a hidden fawn lies so close, the leopard tries a new approach. Seeing the impala bound away, the leopard watches intently for any sign of the fawn. It has obviously been left behind, but where? If the fawn betrayed its presence now, the end would be swift. prowess, the leopard is like most big cats. She misses more often than she kills. Not until the leopard is long gone will the female impala feel it is safe to return to a fawn. It's mid-December and the cubs are five months old. It's time for them to venture out. Their mother killed an impala in the night and left it under an acacia tree not far from the wooded ridge that is their home. The male cub has been the first to reach the kill and claim possession. Like all leopards, he is not inclined to share. Only when he's satisfied will the others be allowed to feed. But the mother is watchful. Out in the open, her cubs are more vulnerable. For a hungry cub, it's a trial to be patient as Big Brother eats his fill. The female's concern is well-founded, for the smell of the carcass attracts another animal, the hyena.
Hyenas have the most powerful bone-crushing jaws in Africa and show no fear of leopards. There is no alternative for the female but to grab the meat and go where no hyena can follow. Even in the midst of this emergency, the young male is annoyed at having his meal taken away from him. Up here, the leopards are safe. So is the kill, and the hyenas know it. But hardly have they turned to go before the family squabble returns to Earth. Mother does not try to intervene. Instead, she stands guard over her family, watching intently as the hyenas retreat. Only after the danger has passed does she eat what little food the youngsters have left. It is now high time to return to the safety of the lair. The female calls softly to her cubs. She is bringing them to heel before setting off. By late morning, the sun is very hot and the family pauses to drink. Pools like this are relatively rare, but leopards are quite able to survive on fluids they obtain when they consume their prey. It's the end of December. In the chilly dawn, male topi antelopes begin the elaborate ritual of courtship. Among the creatures of the Maasai Mara, a new year is beginning. Mother Leopard is now seeking larger prey for her fast-growing cubs. 
Termite mounds are good lookout posts from which to watch for game in the long grass. She begins to stalk a herd of impala and topi, which are feeding peacefully together. Adult topi are quite powerful, weighing three times as much as a leopard. To increase her chances of success, she's probably intent on capturing a younger animal. Her charge scatters the antelope. Surprisingly, she catches not a youngster, but an adult topi by its muzzle, a poor hold. The topi tries to shake her off, trampling the tenacious leopard and the cat struggles for a suffocating grip. The battle ends, a momentary truce in the game of life and death. There will be another time, another place. Bloodied and exhausted, the leopard does not even try to follow. The topi is hobbling, its hind leg badly swollen from a previous injury. Perhaps that's why the leopard chose it in the first place. On the way back to her lair, the leopard too is limping. There was more fight in the topi than she bargained for. She doesn't seem to be badly hurt, but any injury is serious if it prevents the animal from hunting well. The leopard's fate now lies in her ability to make a swift recovery and hunt again. Meanwhile, she and the cubs will go hungry. The next few days will be critical. For three days, the leopard seems to have vanished from these woodlands of the Maasai Mara. On the fourth morning, however, it's business as usual. Luckily, she's made a prudent kill, a female impala. The leopard has recovered quickly. Like all big cats, she must be resilient to survive the endless perils of the African bush. The January sun is slowly drying out the landscape. 
The short rains, as they are known, have passed. The rivers are dwindling. In a few shrinking pools, catfish find a final refuge. The plains quiver as noon temperatures soar. Seeking what little shade they can find, lions and hyenas rest uncomfortably close to one another. When it's so hot, the leopards are seldom seen. Most of the big carnivores are resting, but this is the time when another spotted cat comes out to hunt. A female cheetah and her family roam across the leopard's range, seeking prey. Her favorite is the little Thompson's gazelle, or Tommy. At first glance, cheetahs and leopards may look alike, but the loose-limbed cheetah is a racer, not a stalker. Its long body is designed for running down the fleet-footed gazelles on the open plains. Its head is smaller than a leopard's, with distinctive marks like tear stains. And, unlike the leopard, the cheetah has a coat with spots of solid black. Both are swift and stealthy killers, but the cheetah is unmatched for high-speed hunting. For the female cheetah, this young Tommy was an easy catch. But there's more to this hunt than a quick meal for her cubs. She's giving them an opportunity to hone their predatory skills, perfecting their instinctive knack for tripping prey. In a few months' time, they will have to fend for themselves. After a kill, the cheetahs act quite differently than leopards. There is no squabbling. All three cheetahs eat side by side, bolting their food as fast as they can. Out in the open, they are easily seen and may lose their prey to lions or hyenas, or even vultures. It's late afternoon. The leopard has been enjoying the cool breezes up on the ridge, despite the irritating presence of the tsetse flies. Unlike the cheetah, she hunts where there is plenty of cover, or when she is concealed by the shadow of the night. Resting between hunts, she grooms and licks herself. This not only keeps her clean, but also gives her extra vitamin D, which is produced in her coat by exposure to sunlight. Away from the lair, she seldom stays in one place for long. She's a restless wanderer. 
Her tail is a giveaway to her many moods. While wandering, she keeps it raised high, an indication that she's not intent on hunting. Still, during the day, there is less competition from the lions and hyena. If she comes across potential prey, she may decide to give chase. The giraffe hardly bats an eyelid as she passes. These extraordinary animals were thought by the ancient Greeks to be a cross between a leopard and a camel, a sort of camelopard. Even today, scientists know them as Giraffa camelopardalis. The one-ton adult giraffes are in no danger from any spotted cat, whatever mood the hunter's tail might suggest. She does have hunting on her mind, but her eye is on these Tommies. She crawls closer, but catches sight of an adult impala whose presence blocks her approach. She changes course until a termite mound conceals her from the impala. The ambush has been set. A few paces ahead, the unsuspecting Tommy seems to beckon her. But it just isn't her day for hunting. The startled warthog foils her plan. Her tail seems to signal her frustration. She'll try again, but under cover of darkness. Draped in a tree, a leopard is fairly easy to find. That may be why this leopardess spends little time in trees. She hides most of her kills in dense bush, where the cubs are less conspicuous. The cubs are seven months old now, and they are no longer confined to the original lair. When the female makes a kill, she hides it in a convenient thicket like this one and escorts the cubs to it. Hungry but well rested, she goes to join her cubs. Confronted with the prospect of sharing the food, the male cub protests as loudly as ever. Lions regard leopards as competitors, 
and will kill them if they can. The cries of the male cub and his sisters have not gone unnoticed. It's not unknown for lions to climb trees, but luckily for the cub, this tree is too thorny for them. Her sister and mother have chosen this much smaller tree, where they seem to be safe for the moment. Yet even now, the danger is not over. In the Mara, lions often kill leopards, and especially leopards under siege. If the cub loses its nerve and tries to run the gauntlet, the end will be swift. Unable to find a way past the thorns, the lions finally lose interest and move off. But one of the cubs is missing. The young male is not in any of the trees. He may have hidden somewhere else, or even returned to the original lair. Or perhaps he's fallen victim to the lion's surprise attack. Tonight, the leopard family will be one fewer. are dampening these Maasai Mara plains. At 5,000 feet above sea level, the mornings are chill and misty, even though the equator is relatively close. The rain encourages a flush of new grass. The two female cubs are now eight months old and slip frequently from one hiding place to another, staying nowhere for more than a day or so. They are still dependent on the kills their mother goes out to make. the first rains, herds of zebra come in search of the fresh grass. In the heat of the day, they troop in from the plains to drink at a spring at the foot of the leopard's ridge. The water hole is small. The thirsty zebras patiently wait their turn.
With their boldly striped coats, zebras may look pleasantly attractive, but they also possess a powerful kick. A stallion can easily break a lion's jaw or smash a leopard's ribs. When the bickering subsides, the adults and their foals wander out into the leopard's range. She's quietly dozing, but her ears are alert to the zebra's approach. Unaware of her presence, the zebras wander up to the tree to rub themselves free of irritating parasites. The 600-pound adult zebras arouse her interest, but she wouldn't risk an attack on them. She has her eye on this foal. has broken the neck of the foal. For her, it was an unusual method of attack. She usually hunts through thick cover on the ground, but she is always ready for an opportunity, and surprise is the leopard's greatest weapon. One mother's loss is another mother's gain. But the leopard now has a problem. The foal weighs at least as much as she does. She might manage to carry it back to her cubs more than a mile away, but she would risk losing it to others on the way. On the other hand, there's no place to hide it here on the ground while she fetches the cubs. And already the scavengers have gotten wind of her kill. There's only one way to go. She carries the whole weight of the foal in her jaws. The climb is an incredible feat of strength, but it's one thing to get up and quite another to stay there. Her usual prey, antelope, are easily anchored in a tree by their horns, but the zebra has none, another problem for the leopard. Gravity puts the problem back on the ground. By now the leopard is exhausted and the hyenas are moving in. There is no time to rest. She must try again or lose her prize. With the carcass safely stored, she can relax at last. April ushers in the season of long rains.
The family of leopards is still together, and between meals, the cubs are as playful as ever. Even as they play, the cubs are demonstrating their instinctive grasp of hunting skills. Here, the leopard's swift and savage pounce is being practiced on a patient parent. For another six months or more, the mother leopard will care for her cubs. They are now nine months old. Already they can kill lizards and birds on their own. But it will be some time before they can tackle an adult impala or a topi. Unexpectedly, as the two female cubs play in the forest nearby, the mother begins to behave strangely, calling out as if her cubs were missing. Suddenly, another cub appears. It's the young male that vanished after the skirmish with the lions six weeks ago. How has he survived in the African bush at an age when most cubs are unable to fend for themselves? It seems that he has been here all the time, although he has remained invisible until now. Truly a secret leopard in the making. With so much competition here from other hunters, it's unusual for a leopard to raise so many cubs, even to this tender age. For months, this graceful animal has demonstrated her ability to rear a family despite enormous danger. She will nurture many cubs during her 12 years or so of life. And because of her, we'll know a little more about those future leopards of the Maasai Mara. National Geographic video. Vesuvius. In a blast of fury, it swallowed the Roman towns of Pompeii and Herculaneum. And for centuries, their secrets lay buried in mystery. Now, the shroud is lifted. Out of the ashes of an ancient disaster, a story emerges. And disaster may well strike again, but a proud and vibrant people stubbornly remain in its path. Join National Geographic on the threshold of history in the shadow of Vesuvius. They are man's closest living relatives, but for centuries we knew little about them. Now, from two continents comes an intriguing portrait of the creatures that for so long have fascinated and eluded us. The great apes. I had a tremendous sense of curiosity about the animals. I wanted to know all there was to be known about them, and happily, I was rewarded by the same curiosity from the animals. Sometimes it was difficult to know who was the observer and who was the observed. Journey on two groundbreaking missions with renowned zoologists Diane Fossey and Birute Goldicos Brindamore and share in their startling discoveries. 
Join National Geographic on the search for the great apes. Continue your exploration of the world with National Geographic magazine. Get 12 monthly issues filled with the same kind of spectacular photography you enjoy in National Geographic videos, plus captivating stories on fascinating people and places, incredible animals, yesterday's world, and today's amazing science and discovery. You'll enjoy all this by becoming a member of the National Geographic Society. You'll also receive six valuable maps, and you'll support important scientific research, like the Titanic expedition. To join, phone or write the Society at this address. National Geographic Video, undeniably collective and affordably priced, only from Vestron Video.